Thank you very much. Um, since our uh, esteemed president uh, was rather brief in his introduction of the executive secretary, let me say just a few additional words uh, before I give the floor to uh, His Excellency uh, Dr. Messina Zerbo. I think, as you all know, uh, Dr. Zerbo has a very long and distinguished career. <coughs> Uh, both as a scientist uh, as well as the head of an international uh, organization. Uh, Dr. Zerbo received a PhD in geophysics from the University of Paris in 1993. Um, he began a, a career in the field some 25 years ago uh, and has worked for uh, many years uh, at the CTBTO before assuming his current responsibilities as executive secretary. And I can go into more detail about his professional activities. But what I find most striking, and this is something uh, that I have acquired, I think, a good feel for over the last six months uh, in particular, is uh, Dr. Zerbo's commitment uh, to the training of the next generation of uh, nonproliferation and disarmament specialists. And perhaps what was most uh, compelling to me uh, was something that we both participated in yesterday at Stanford University. This was a, a conference that was convened by Secretaries uh, Bill Perry and George Schultz, had a number of very senior other figures, including Under Secretary Rose Gottemutler. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, after our workshop, there was a, a dinner, uh, and there was a, an, a, a series of, of, uh, dis, of remarks made uh, by Secretary Perry, Secretary Schultz, uh, uh, Under Secretary Rose Gottemuller, and Executive Secretary Asina Zerbo. And the first thing that I remember you mentioning last night was not the other distinguished guests that we had around uh, the room, and there were many, many CEOs of uh, various uh, Silicon Valley firms, other government officials, uh, major figures in the field. But Dr. Zerbo chose to speak about a 16-year-old high school student uh, who had interned uh, at Stanford with uh, Secretaries Perry uh, and Schultz. And this young man was particularly interested uh, in the CTBTO. And it was this focus on young people uh, at this very august gathering that I think is illustrative of uh, another dimension to, the, uh, uh, to Dr. Zerbo's uh, uh, very impressive career in as a scientist and as a, a political and international organizational figure. And I think that's what also brings him uh, to Monterey uh, today. And while I can't trot out uh, a lot of uh, former secretaries of state uh, and, and defense here, what I can introduce you to, uh, Dr. Zerbo, uh, is a very impressive group of young people from many different countries, I'm not sure how many countries we have represented here, who are anxious to follow in your footsteps uh, working uh, in the international uh, community to promote uh, peace and security. And so it's a great opportunity uh, to welcome you here, and we really look forward to your remarks. And I should also probably, for those of you who don't know, uh, a traveling companion of, uh, of Dr. Zerbo, Mr. Jean Dupree, uh, who for many years also served uh, as director of our international organizations and non-proliferation companies. So John, I want to also extend a welcome back to my Thank you. Lucina, please, sir. Thank you, Bill. Uh, first of all, let me uh, thank Bill for his uh, kind uh, words of introduction. And uh, uh, thanking him as well, I was saying to uh, uh, at Stanford yesterday, uh, that I was thanking the organizers for bringing the executive secretary, but I was thanking them more for bringing somebody uh, who I would say I consider myself to be an anomaly in this system, in this field of uh, arms control, non-proliferation, disarmament. Why? Because uh, coming from a tiny little country, this is not traditionally that we deal with uh, nuclear test monitoring and full force. But I mean, it's a pleasure to be here because Bill asked me to come. Uh, because uh, by coming here and then talking to you, uh, as Bill said, I used to be young as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, and then I, I went through your path. And I know 
that if you don't share experience with the young generation, you don't, you don't have an opportunity to inspire them to be where you've been and where you're going. And this is why I make it my task, uh, because I've come from a long, long, long way to be where I am today. And I want many of you, and I know some of you, maybe one of you will be the next Director General of this Comprehensive Test Plan Treaty Organization. At least this is what I wish at this class of today. And I wish you to follow the footsteps of those who have come before me, uh, to follow my footsteps and do better than what we've done. And this is why uh, today I'm so pleased, so proud, so privileged, and so humbled to be among you to talk about what I've experienced and what I'm doing as Executive Secretary of the CTBT and at the same time why I think uh, we must uh, thank Bill and his team at the Center of Non-Proliferation Study uh, to give the education framework to people before you, to you today and then to people tomorrow and the next generation uh, for all of you to make sure uh, we live in a safe and secure world and then we prepare the ground for the future generation for a world free of nuclear weapons. This is our ultimate goal. And you heard many people before me say that we might not do it in our lifetime. I might not do it in our lifetime, but I hope you will do it. At least some of you. So we might not see the entry into force of the CPG, but I still hope that, you know, I wish it was yesterday. Uh, but I wish at least I'll do it during my term. But if I don't, I want to have the feeling that me and my team have done the best possible to set the seed for the entry into force of the treaty and that you guys would follow the footsteps. So Bill, thank you for uh, training and educating this young generation and exchanging and then creating the seed for us to use you sometime to, and I hope some of you will come as intern. And then we have already a lot of people coming from this center who are doing an excellent work in Vienna. Excellent work. And then I'm learning a lot from them because you see uh, many people have learned from me when I used to be scientist. And I'm learning a lot from those people who are in political science and non preparation and design. And I'm looking forward to learning from some of you when you join the CTBT and then we'll be able to advance this agenda together and get closer and closer to the entry into force. So this is on an introductory remark. And since, Mr. President, we've passed the NPT review conference and then now we're in an informal setting, uh, I want it to be really an informal debate. I want to share with you what I've done, but I want more uh, to call upon your question because it's with your question that I'll be able to talk, I'll be able to tell you, you know, how I'm passionate about what I'm doing and then try to inspire some passion from you guys as well. Bill said that uh, from yesterday meeting, he realized that uh, he's an entrepreneur, okay? Uh, because we learned yesterday that uh, entrepreneurship is all about coming and changing the world, okay? Uh, but somebody said that he came to understand the world, and another said that, no, he's coming to save the world so that you guys can change it. <laughs> so now you have to choose where you stand. So Bill and I can tell you where we stand, but I want you guys to save the world so that you can change it and the future generation will change it with you and for you. So now, why a test ban? I'm sure you've uh, uh, learned and then gone through many of the literature. The test ban because uh, you've probably heard from, I think it was Bill Clinton who said this was the longest sought uh, treaty ever in the history of arms control because this treaty has been discussed and negotiated for so long. It started by, you heard us talking about the partial test ban treaty and now the comprehensive test ban treaty. And uh, uh, why test ban? Because it's through testing that people develop nuclear weapon. Okay. I was uh, talking to Dr. Sieg Eger, former Director General of the Los Alamos Laboratory this morning. And then, you know, sometimes we're wondering, if I want to make the case for the entry into force of the CTBT or the ratification of the treaty by some of the country, what should I say? If I come to you and then I say, you know, let's stop or let's ban testing. I mean, very few people know what testing is all about. But if I say, let's make sure no one uses nuclear weapon, then it makes a difference. And that's what Zigeke was telling me this morning. So you see, I'm still learning. 
Okay? Uh, he said this to me this morning, and I found it's probably a better way to approach this thing wherever I go. Why? Because when I'm in Africa, or in the Pacific, or in Latin America, when I say I'm the executive secretary of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization, first of all, the word CTBT is too complicated. And Mr. Chairman, you agree with me that uh, if you had a you know, shorter uh, uh, acronym, it would have been better. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, since we are in, let me say that uh, when, I, when people ask me, they say, OK, why aren't you in agriculture? Uh, which I would say would be in the traditional field where people from my part of the world will uh, do an expertise on and then try to move on. But you say, you, when you do uh, agriculture, uh, it means that there's peace around you. You can't be farming if there's no peace. Okay? And that's why it's as important to make sure the world is safe and secure for all of us so that we can farm, we can do a lot to develop. And that's how we bring the test ban, making sure that no nuclear test explosion goes undetected. This is our job. And this is not my job only, it's a job where we need leadership from all of you. We need leadership from Bill, from what he's doing here, because Bill is teaching most of you and all of you how you should put the seeds to making sure that not only no nuclear test explosion goes undetected, but that no nuclear weapon is ever used, and that we move towards a world free of nuclear weapons. And that's why I'm so proud and so blessed to be in this field. I'm coming from the industry, don't forget that. I'm a geophysicist. I'm saying, I used to be a geophysicist, because I'm not a geophysicist anymore. I mean, if you put some physical equation today, you know, I doubt if I would be able to to recognize them because I've been uh, I've been distorted by diplomats around me. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, it's becoming tough and tough. Okay, so but anyway, I still uh, use my uh, science background to do something different. You know, uh, Jeff Lewis was asking me, "What can we talk about tomorrow?" I say anything you want because I'm not a diplomat. <laughs> okay. I won't be scared to answer questions because I can have the excuse to not be a diplomat and then people say, no, he's not a diplomat. He, you know, that's why he said this. You know, that's why it's good to be a scientist. <laughs> 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 be careful with yeah. this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, I mean, this is all about test ban. So now, let me go into, uh, I think I've touched a little bit on the effort to achieve uh, test ban. In the effort to achieve test ban, Many people have done before us. We're trying to do what we can, and then we're counting on you guys to do more in the future. But it all started with putting some scientific ground to verify compliance to this treaty. Because what is this treaty about? Monitoring the earth, monitoring the ocean, monitoring the earth, to make sure no one carries a test explosion underwater on the ground or in the air. And to do that, you need technology, you need science. And this is how you take scientists like me in this field, because you know, being a geophysicist, they often say, if they ask you what's the definition of a geophysicist, I say a geophysicist is somebody who looks for what is never lost. That's what a geophysicist is about. But if you look at on-site inspection, uh, we have one coming in Jordan. Uh, one journalist asked me in Jordan, will you carry an explosion, a nuclear explosion, and then search for it? <laughs> of course, that's not what we're doing. What we do, and what we'll be doing, is to look for potential evidence of an explosion. It could be cavity, it could be fracture, geological fracture. It's to look for structures that are similar to the evidence of an underground explosion. And this is why we need, we're using geophysical techniques. And this is what the monitoring technology that we use are all about. But this I'm talking about on site, but we're doing remotely. We have a set of stations around the world, 337 facilities, stations, and laboratories with four technologies. Seismic for anything that moves underground, infrasound for anything that moves in the air, hydroacoustic for anything that moves underwater, including marine mammals as they migrate, we can follow their path and then help those who are dealing with environmental issues. We do all this. 
And radionuclide has a smoking gun. The smoking gun is the thing, the sniff that will give us the nuclear nature of an event. But this, here comes the trick. We talk about the nuclear nature of an event by radionuclide isotope. Then diplomats tell us you shouldn't say if the event is a nuclear explosion. You should just say it's an event. You give the specs, location, death, uh, magnitude, whatever you name it. And then you say, by the way, we found a sniff somewhere. And then by atmospheric transport modeling, we think it can be correlated to the event. But you just don't say that one plus one equal two, because some will say equals three, okay? Uh, in diplomacy, I mean, okay? So this is basically what we do. So diplomats have put this treaty in a way where our job is to provide you, state signatories, all the technical specs for you to make up your mind and make your own decision. And that leads me to a point. I'm talking about 183 countries that have signed the treaty. But I mean, do you think our organization is supposed or meant to provide data to all the 183 countries, and then since, I mean, recently, to institutions, scientific institutions as well, for them to work on technology relevant to nuclear test explosion. But if Andrew received the information in the United States in a way where he can deal with it, he understands because he understands the, the science behind it. If you take somebody from Vanuatu, Okay? He's receiving the same data, but how can he advise his authorities on what he has seen? Because we've just said that I'm giving the specs, and it's up to him to decide whether 1 plus 1 equals 2, and advise his authority, and should Vanuatu sit at, or member of uh, Security Council, a non, uh, non-executive member of Security Council, they can advise the, uh, the, the authorities accordingly. So it means that we have to build capacity in the developing world for them to understand the information, the data and product that are coming from the CTBT for them to be able to advise the authority. And this is one of the biggest challenge. And this is why the job that Bill Porter is doing here is as important, not only for the NPT, the CTBT, the OPCW, the whatever treaty or convention you have, but for the developing world. And you were right to put uh, in your statement, talk about development and developing countries, okay? It is important that we build capacity for people to buy into those treaties that traditionally seem so far from their priority. And that's something that I've made my task because I'm coming from developing country. And then I want to make sure people in my part of the world understand why we talk about arms control, non-proliferation, disarmament, and so forth. Why we talk about those technology. And that's why it's important that here you share knowledge. We talk about transfer of knowledge. I don't know if you should say transfer of knowledge, but sharing knowledge. That's basically what it is. Wherever you go, what you've learned here, you should share it in a way where those you talk to understand why you are here. And this is important. You come to learn. It's the same way, like I said, you come to understand the world, you want to save the world, and then change it later. So you come here to understand the science, to understand the policy, and then you, have, you must go out to change the world because of what you've learned here. And this is what is important. Okay? So this is basically the effort that we have to do together to achieve test plan. And then to build the scientific ground to the compliance to the treaty. And this leads me to one point, why I'm passionate to be working for this organization. As a scientist, and I can tell you, and I'm sure as diplomats, many of you, this is a unique organization. I think uh, in my whole, but I was fortunate to work in everything in my profession, and I've worked always in things that I love and like, and I've always been passionate about what I do. But this has become my life. Okay, I, uh, uh, I told Jean this morning that I woke up after talking to Secretary Perry and Secretary Schultz. Uh, I, you know, my dream yesterday was that uh, uh, there's a guy in Vienna at the U.S. mission <coughs> that, you know, that he came to me and then told me, by the way, Dr. Zerbo, uh, do you know, I was told to tell you quietly that the U.S. will bring the CTBT ratification on 26th of March 2016. So you have to put that down because that was my dream yesterday. 
Okay? And you ask me why 26 of March 2016, I don't know, because it was a dream. <laughs> okay, I, I just don't know. But I woke up this morning with that dream. Okay, maybe because I was sitting next to Secretary Schultz and then Bill Perry and Rose Gottmuller. So I was so swamped by the US issue that my brain went into dreaming that the ratification is, like, is, is coming uh, in, the, in the few years, in the years to come. You see, so why? Because I allow myself to dream. And I want you all to allow yourself to dream that one day the world will be free of nuclear weapons. So maybe tonight you will dream that uh, in 10 years the world will be free of nuclear weapons. It will be your dream too. But I learned something from Secretary Schultz yesterday. He said a story, he told us a story that uh, uh, with President Reagan and his wife, and then it was Gorbachev. Yes, it, it was uh, Gromyko. Gromyko. And then uh, ask him, uh, uh, ask her, why do you, you know, does your husband want peace? So of course my husband wants peace. So what you do every night when you go to bed, whisper in his ear, peace, peace. peace. <laughs> <laughs> okay? So what I want you guys to do, when uh, I disappear from Monterey with Jean, Whisper to Bill. <laughs> CTBT, CTBT. <laughs> and then whisper around you, the CTBT must enter into force. It will help us achieve the entry into force of the CTBT. This is to make an analogy with the story I had yesterday. So now we've talked about test ban, we talk about uh, you know why and the effort we're making, we talk about the scientific ground. So now let me go into what we've achieved. Okay? And uh, talk about what we achieved, uh, it was, I was a little bit perplexed when uh, Jean managed to get a title of my talk yesterday, which was a success story in the verification or something like that. Okay? Yeah, nuclear weapon testing. Nuclear weapon testing. So I said to myself, can you imagine somebody walking from Burkina Faso to come and talk about success story in the Silicon Valley? People will see, I mean, what is this crazy man talking about success story in the Silicon Valley? Because there, there are so many success stories. But you know, the CTBT is a real success story in the field of arms control. And I'm going to tell you why. Why? Because your predecessors at the Center of Non-Proliferation Studies who are in Vienna, you can talk to them. I think one of the former presidents is Keegan. If you tell Keegan, I understand Keegan, he could have gone somewhere else, but he wants to be at the CTBT because this is the place to be. It's the place to be because can you imagine if we achieve entry into force, Keegan would be able to sit and then tell his children and grandchildren, I've done something in my life. I've helped the world to be safe and secure. So we built in this international framework an international monitoring system an international data center, an on-site inspection capability that we will foster again during the Jordan exercise to make sure that we have this deterrent that stop people from testing. Since 1996, after thousands of tests in the past, since the CTBT was put for signature in this 21st century, we only have the DPRK to have carbon test. But we picked all three, those three tests. And some of the time people tell me, oh, but they've announced it anyway. But the reality is, whether they did or whether they didn't, we will still see it. Because today, this international monitoring system and its detection threshold is far lower. When I say lower, it means it detects better than what was anticipated by the expert when they negotiated the CTBT and the technological infrastructure to support it. So we built now 90% of this infrastructure. We're so proud of it. It's a billion dollar investment. When I say billion dollar investment, for some, somebody coming from the industry, when you invest, you want to return in investment. The return is what? The return is not, not only the goal that we want to achieve, which is after into force. It's what you get out of CTVT. And yesterday we talked about something. We shouldn't talk about why one of the eight countries is not, they should ratify. We should talk about why they're not ratifying, to talk about the benefit of the CTBT, what you get out of it. 
By having a CTVT and by having an international monitoring system, an international data center that processes, analyzes, and distributes data to all the, the state signatories, and having an on-site inspection capability to form that strong deterrent, we're helping to make our world safe and secure. But not only this, what we're doing as well, we're making sure that the world doesn't return to this armed race during the Cold War so that people can resume testing and make life difficult for all of us. And this is why it's important to have this treaty into force. And when we talk about having it into force, one can argue that some of the major players in this field have their own national technical means. Of course, they have their own national technical needs. But you can have your own. But how do you get the international legitimacy? You can decide on your own that you found something. But I mean, people can still say, why? You talk about yourself. We want to see. But the only institution that will give you that legitimacy is a treaty framework like the CTBT. And that's why it's important. So it's a CTBT. It's international monitoring system combined with the national technical means of all the states that have won, that can serve that strong deterrent, making sure that no nuclear test explosion goes undetected. And this is what we should sell. This is if we talk about our mandate. Now, if I go into some of the spin-offs of the technology that we're using, we talk about what we call our civil and scientific application. Uh, you've heard we had an agreement with UNESCO IOC to help institutions dealing with tsunami warning. And this is what we've been doing since 2008, 2009. Making sure that the reliable data that we have from all set of in in seismic infrastructure is made available to international institutions for them to deal with their warning system. Because we have a reliable system that goes through a reliable global communication infrastructure. When I say global communication infrastructure, our data come from station and go through a communication infrastructure which is satellites or secure internet, authenticated data, to go first to Vienna, back to the member state, both in raw data or in product. Okay? And now we're making this data available for tsunami warning institution. But beyond that, Fukushima. I mentioned it in my statement during your uh, NPT review conference. And tsunami, uh, Fukushima. When Fukushima happened, it's only then that people realize that our seismic network was able to detect the earthquake. The hydroacoustic together with the seismic was able to detect the tsunami. The infrasound, the explosion of the nuclear power plant and the radionuclear, the dispersion, the only institution to follow the dispersion of radioisotope globally. And within two weeks, we're able to see that isotope move from the northern hemisphere to the southern one, which is unusual, knowing the circulation of wind around the equator. So those are the information that we give to the international community. And this is what we should sell, especially to the developing world. Those who don't see this as their priority, they should see value in the data, the technology, and the information that we provide. And this is what we should share. And this is what we should sell. And I want you to take that as well in the course that you have here uh, with Bill Porter in terms of disarmament. When you go and talk about disarmament non-proliferation, and when you go to the developing country, tell them that to, you talk about peace, you talk about security, but you care about development. And it's important then they will listen to you. Okay, so now we talk about the progress of the system, where we are. But if you build a system, you've progressed, you're proud of your system, what should you do? You have to maintain it. So we operate a system, we, we maintain and sustain. This is the biggest challenge of this organization. How to operate and maintain an aging system, bearing in mind that station, you build them, but I mean, some take 10 years, some take 20, but the stations are aging and dying. But the budget of the organization is not increasing. And this is a challenge of a manager like myself, because I have to make sure that under zero real growth, I can still operate an aging system and make sure that the return investment that people are expecting is still to their expectation. And this is our biggest challenge. Challenge because there is, a, I heard that in the Silicon Valley, you can make mistakes, okay? 
But in the Silicon Valley as well, if you're not happy with the policy, you make your own policy. Okay? But we're not allowed to do that. We're not allowed to make mistakes. Because if I don't provide, if my organization doesn't provide data the way member states are expecting, I'm in trouble. So there's no room for mistake. So you have a, a stable budget, you have an aging system, and you still have to remain at the edge of the technology. And this is why we've developed what we call our science and technology set of conferences to stop from thinking within the box and exchange with the scientific community, exchange with the policy makers, exchange with the young generation, exchange with you all to see how together we can have a cost-effective verification regime that serves the international community. We must open ourselves to the rest of the world. We must open ourselves to new ideas that are coming from you all, from people like yourself. Because we can sit and be proud of what we've built. But I mean, you can only be proud and think that you are unique. But there might be aspect of what you think is unique that people can bring room for improvement. And this is what we should look for. And this is what we're doing in our science and technology processes. So I invite some of you to join us in June 2015 to participate in Vienna to our 2015 Science and Technology Conference because the first two days are mainly on policy, science and diplomacy. This is what it's all about, where you fit and where you will be working in your field. So you are welcome to join us in this Science and Technology Conference because we're unique but we're not perfect. We have to improve ourselves. And this is what we're trying to do. So now, I've talked about the system, I've talked about what we go, I've talked about where we need improvement. So what do you think I should talk about now? You think it's finished? And then you tell me, and then I close my books, and then we stop the discussion. Yeah. <laughs> eh? What should I talk about? How about those 20 member states, the ones that have signed but not ratified? OK. The eight, you mean? Eight, sorry, eight. Yeah. OK, that's a good point. And uh, in fact, that's what I was about to talk about, so you read my mind. <laughs> because to deal with those people, what I've initiated when I took office, it's a group of eminent person. OK? And I'll tell you an anecdote about that. I've really, when I had the group, uh, some members, uh, some ambassador were arguing. They say, Dr. Zerbo, I mean, we have uh, one or two or three members. In uh, What can you tell us that they are eminent? But some became eminent, okay? Some were eminent, and then they became more eminent, okay? I'm pleased to say that uh, the next, uh, how you call this I function? High representative. High, European Union High Representative for uh, foreign, affairs. foreign Affairs and Security is a member of the group of eminent person, and she's young too. I used to be young. <laughs> no, I'm not eminent. Okay, so and maybe one of you will be a member of this group when uh, His Excellency Andrew Brown uh, takes over as Director General of the CTO. <laughs> okay, but I think it's unlikely because he's from the United States, and yeah, <laughs> none of the P5 can be, yeah, okay, so that's a problem. So, <laughs> but Andrew, Andrew, that might change. You have to be careful, that might change. You see, you know, when, uh, uh, when I was. Uh, uh, running for the position, you know, one would have hoped that, okay, you had a European and then maybe, no, Europe would not have candidate. But we had a European candidate. So now people don't care anymore, okay? So you never know. You might find yourself director of <coughs> one day. Uh, you know, my replacement as director of international data center is an American. When we talk about it, people say, how dare an American become uh, <laughs> the director of the international data center where all the sensitive information are coming and so forth. You see, he was able to do because he has on top of him somebody from Burkina Faso. <laughs> so you never know. <laughs> okay, look, I, uh, to answer your question, I initiated the group of eminent persons to that effect. To do what? Because, let's face it, at the CTBT we've done a lot. We've reached out to 183 countries that have signed the treaty. And 163 that have ratified. So the eight remaining which ratification is necessary for its entry into force. If you take US, China, India, Pakistan, Israel, Egypt, Iran, the DPRK. Tough, isn't it? <laughs> okay? So you take those eight countries, they have their own domestic issue where they're not ratified. So 
When I come to the U.S., I'm not here to chant on every roof, ratify, ratify, ratify. What I have to do is to tell them, hey guys, you've invested in this organization, we've done a lot with your money, we think you're getting something out of this money that you've invested. Now use it to build the momentum within your country to build the trust for your people to believe that this treaty is worth it and that's ratified. And this is what I'm doing. But I did my part. We did our part in the preparatory commission. We needed people with the credential, the experience. People like Kevin Rudd, former prime minister. People like uh, Igor Ivanov, former foreign minister of, the, 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 of Russia. We need those guys to be able to talk about the relevance of the CTBT, whatever they are. Because I'm not everywhere, unfortunately. Or fortunately for my, for my family. Okay, so we want them to be able to talk whatever they are to keep the CTBT on their agenda. Because as I learned again yesterday, the point is not to be deep into one thing, it's to be broad. When you talk about nuclear security, you have to see what aspects you can bring the CTBT into it so that people see that this treaty is yet to enter into force. Okay? When you talk about environmental issue, when you talk about tsunami, depending on where you are, if you are in Japan, tell them that the CTBT is important for tsunami. So you have to talk about the relevance of this organization to whoever deals with it, for them to see value, to buy into it, so that this treaty can be as universal as possible. And I wanted a group of eminent persons to do that for us. Not for me, but for the CTBT. And this is what they've been doing. And as you found out, in June, we had, for instance, in the G7 the, uh, statement, there was a, a reference to the CTBT and the group of eminent person. But I can tell you one thing. When, if you're not passionate about what you do, when I started the CTBT, Jean, for instance, who we've been working uh, together for uh, the past five years, Jean joined the organization five years ago, he told me later, but Lassina, you know what? I didn't believe in this thing when you started. I didn't know that it would take off. But he agreed with me that this thing has taken off and then we must put all effort for it to go and for people to use it. And this is what we do. So the message here, when you go back to where you are, it's true. You'll be scared of your boss. But if you believe in what you're talking about, try to convince your boss. If it's coming from deep inside, and you convinced that this is the way it should go, that this is the way it should be, tell your boss, convince him. Same as I think you're convincing Bill Potter when he doesn't agree with you. And I hope you do. Okay, this is what you should take from this uh, thing. And this is at least what I'm trying to do. When people believe that you're sincere and that you're passionate about what you do, that you have reason to fight for it, they will listen to you. Because they know that you're not here with a hidden agenda. And often don't be there with a hidden agenda because hidden agendas never help. You have to be true to yourself and true to the cause, true to what you want to achieve, and then you'll do it together. So I'm hoping and counting on you guys to join us in our campaign to make sure the CTBT remains relevant so that people remember that this job is unfinished. The treaty is yet to enter into force, and we need you. Thank you. Thank you so much.